I just probably talked about that a lot, but um, the, uh, the guitar players in the James Brown band always were able to find the guitar part that made the song. You know, if you listen to those records, you can really, there's, there's a lot of times two guitar players and they have a very defined part. And uh, that definitely was where Lettuce, you know, got a lot of our sound from. It's me and Adam finding these places where, where we can find rhythmic parts. Kind of like how in like, <coughs> if you listen to West African music, a lot of the percussionists, they find the little spaces in between for their part to kind of, and as it gels, you feel the rhythm kind of get deeper and deeper into this groove. Um, and so a lot of those guys, you know, like uh, Jimmy Nolan was one of the guys, and um, Cornell Dupree was the guy who played Aretha, Aretha Franklin and Donny Hathaway, um, Catfish Collins, who's the brother of Bootsy Collins. And I'm just gonna play like a couple of the guitar parts that, uh, that got me kind of started in that vein. that sound the way it is is a couple things. One thing is I've got the guitar and the back pickup, which is like the rear pickup, which kind of gives it that more kind of percussive, like tinny sound. The other thing is like if I'm playing the guitar up here, it's going to sound like this. If I play it back here, it gives it a much more twangy, brighter, kind of more percussive sound. And because the when I play it lower towards the saddle, it becomes tighter, which makes me able to kind of play it harder, you know, it gives it that. And, um, a lot of times what those guys did is they would either find something that worked around the bass line, the bass line or sometimes they would just lock in with the bass, and that's a lot of, another thing that I do a lot with Eric and Lettuce is we lock in with the bass line, and a lot, and a lot of times my favorite part of the show is if, we're, if we find something that we've never played before and I hear him start to play and we start playing off of each other and then locking into something that's brand new. Um, which will kind of bring me to a whole other place which is you know, improvising with the people you're with. Um, and uh, one thing that we've developed, like Kevin said, we all met at Berkeley back in the day and we all you know, not only had similar musical tastes but you know, we became really good friends and were able to communicate really well and that you know that's another thing I play with Neil is that because we know each other so well we kind of if we start to hint at going to a certain place we can follow one another you know and as you anyone that a lot of you guys in bands too you guys and uh, you know what you'll find is the more you guys hang out the more you guys kind of learn about each other the more on stage you become comfortable in finding these these cool different places that you've never been before and that's Honestly, you know, why we have so much fun, like playing last night, there was definitely moments that I didn't know what was going on, you know, <laughs> or, and then, but fun, you know, it's that moment of not knowing quite what's going on and then finding something brand new. It's like that little bridge, if you make it over that bridge, or sometimes we don't, <laughs> but if we do, it's like the best feeling in the world, you know, and I feel like everybody knows that somehow, you know, because that's when people start doing this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> So um, again, I'm going to talk about some different different influences. Uh, a lot of you guys know the Meters, right? Yeah. Um, that was a big influence of mine too. And uh, <coughs> kind of in the same, he was from that same era and that same style. But um, to get a little more technical, he would use the the middle position. This is a 335 guitar. Anybody, you guys, recognize this, right? Well, this is what what Leo played. What I discovered a few years ago, when I, and this was a recent discovery, um, when I, I, had, I played with George Porter and the Funky Meters, <laughs> and I had to learn, the, I, knew, I thought I knew all these guitar parts because I messed around and at gigs people were like, oh, Sissy Strut, or um, Just Kiss My Baby, some of the more famous tunes, and I would just fake it. And then when I actually listened to the records, I started realizing what he was actually doing, and I found that he uses this middle, this middle uh, position, which basically is kind of uh, out of phase with these two pickups here. So like... One of the great things about 
about what I learned from him is, is uh, you know, he can play without a drummer, even though he played with the greatest drummer, probably what, what influenced him, but a lot of, it's like the hi-hat, you know? And uh, the, other, the other thing about his playing, um, and a lot of those guys, Carnell Dupree too, is um, they would take a lot of the voicings, a lot of you guys probably know this, the Hendrix chord. A lot of you guitar players might know that one from. Uh, and take chords like that, like for example, and just move the upper notes, because if you have a bass player playing with you, you don't always have to play the whole chord, and that's one of the things that I've also been learning more more recently really is that when you have so you know Neil's playing so much down here that uh, to really get the the colors of the chords is important but not have to play the whole thing so like here you're really hearing the top notes where he's changing that he's a minor third here and then, and then he's playing the root there and then you can really use it to, to make a melody out of the what you're what you're playing even though you're just using the same rhythm with this hands Another another uh, version that is a lot of people you know the major chord. Um, you know, just first of all, you know what uh, what he would do is he play the chord. You know, first of all, like knowing it in every possible place, and then uh, kind of learning the um, different inversions where you basically. You know, using again using the same same rhythm with your right hand and trying to move move around within that scale. It's all major scale. And, uh, yeah, I mean, really, it's funny how how close that that really is to bluegrass. You know, you got some blue any bluegrass fans here, but you know, my, bro my brother's actually a great banjo player. <laughs> and uh, he used to, him and my dad used to make me sit there and go. And uh, when I tried to solo, they said, you can solo when, uh, when you got your own kids, you know, that's what my dad would say. <laughs> <laughs> so that was probably where I got some of the rhythm from. Um, anybody got any questions on 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 that, like the rhythm rhythm guitar playing in general? Yeah, I think it's different for everybody, but um, I think what helped me a lot when I was starting is I, 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 I same thing. I messed around and I had you know family that played, but when I could apply it to things that I really loved, like I would learn song. You know, like first thing I ever did was I think learn <laughs> because it was like you know I was so into Led Zeppelin it was it was ridiculous. I was, and then eventually Hendrix. So it was like learning those songs first, and I needed to learn from somebody what the chords were. I mean, I was, I, I remember I learned this part. And then I was, you know, learning the G chord and the, the D chord. And I think having, and then really from there, once I learned kind of the chords that went together, and, I, and then from there I could sit there and jam for hours, and then I would start finding, it's kind of like you need that little push, and then you can, develop so many things on your own. I think that's important too. Like it's great to take lessons, but it's also really important to explore things on your own and, and find your own that's gonna help you find your own sound, you know. But um I think 
transcribe, like they call it transcribing when you listen and you sit down and you, and you learn someone else's solo. I think it's really valuable. I remember learning, um, um, I think it was Donna Lee or something like that. And I probably can't play it now, but I probably play, I probably can't play the song now, but I probably use the licks from it all the time, you know, because there's all these different little things that, that, um, that can, I can incorporate into my, into my sound without totally ripping it off. I mean, that's the art form really is how much can you take from what you're listening to without, you know, spitting it out verbatim. Um, and I guess that's really taking it and then exploring with it. Um, but yeah, I think it is valuable for sure to like learn those basic chords, but then, like you said, just sit there and, and play with it and make it your own. Anyone else? Well, the cool thing about Yusef was um, he, I, he made me play other instruments. That was his thing. He made me play bass in the class. He made me play piano in the class. Um, so he, I, he made me train. I, when he heard me, I was, he heard me messing around on the piano and he was like, oh, he can really play piano. I was like, oh, I can play in G, D, and C. <laughs> so he's like, all right, learn this solo in C sharp. That was what he said right then. I had to learn this solo in C sharp. And I, again, I can't play it right now, but it was something that helped me so much. Now I can play in some other keys, you know? So he, he was really good at, A, like finding something that was uncomfortable to you and then making you do it. And then the other, and then the other thing was, again, I mean, he was all about, like, don't sound like anybody else, which was really refreshing. Because a lot of teachers I'd had previous to that were like, oh, you gotta listen to this guy. It's all about Wes Montgomery, <laughs> well, who I love. I mean, but, uh, um, he was really all about like I remember when he saw my pedals he was so freaked out because I was always I've always been a dork about pedals and gear and stuff and uh, I brought my pedals in and he was just like oh my god like put it on a minor second and turn it all the way up you know the harmonizer and I was like oh. <laughs> you know but he, he was really cool he was like it was funny he was really into hip hop he always wanted to hear what what the current rap was you know. And so I'd bring stuff in, but if but it was all like had profanity in it, so he didn't he didn't dig it. But he always into the beats. <laughs> he loved how people used technology and and uh, which was cool. I mean, he's eighty. He's like eighty five now. If you guys don't know who Yusef Latif is, Yusef Latif um, was a saxophone player with Dizzy Gillespie, who then moved to Africa and while was while he was there, picked up all these rhythms and and scales and instruments and brought them back and. He's a flute player and a tenor sax player, and you guys should check out his music. He's one of like, I mean, he made albums in the 60s that sounded like the future now. You know, it was uh, like really psychedelic, and like he was a, a, a really incredibly trained jazz guy. But he also played oboe and bassoon, and uh, really soulful music, but um, was never like a huge name like Coltrane. But he actually taught Coltrane. He actually was one of his, Teach. He was like a few years older than him, which taught him a lot of the stuff that he learned being in other countries and stuff. So, um, any other questions before I move on? Uh, yeah, I don't use compression as much. He asked if uh, how how compression affects my right hand technique and the rhythmic stuff that I'm doing. A compressor basically kind of takes both ends of what you're playing and equalizes it somewhat so you can't play much louder and much softer, um, which is great in the studio. I don't use it much here, but what I do use is this thing called a phaser, um, which is this pedal right over here. And, um, and that, um, really like you know kind of accentuates the rhythmic thing that's going on because it's pushing pushing the EQ around and, and kind of helping the like the song Elrond that we do I've always used either an envelope phase, uh, envelope filter or phaser <laughs> Kind of 
modulation pedal they call it. I use a lot as a tremolo, more for like chord stuff. But. As I change the, the rate of it, it gets more surfy. seen us play I'm always messing around down here um, so that's another kind of maybe I'll get into that now it's a you know I'm, I'm really into um, and this is one of the things that really goes back to Yusef is he was like I wish he was like I wish I was a guitar player because now you can do anything you know and I, I was like well you can do it with a saxophone and that that he never that never registered to him but um, I wish I, I really want to introduce him to Skerrick because that would be, <laughs> be pretty amazing um, Yeah, I mean, again, back to the sound and the tone thing, it's like, I'll start with just the guitar, but what you can do with just the guitar, you know, if I put it on the front pickup here, obviously, you know, going from... And uh, for those of you, um, on the, when, I, when I'm thinking about jazz guitar, I always, Think about I always think about West Montgomery as kind of the basis for for uh, you know where it all comes from. And um, his whole thing was he played with his thumb. He never used a pick. And um, he also it was, you know used a big guitar and, and had it uh, had the bass turned all the way up. But his his technique was much more about um, and again and it, it's pretty amazing because he all always played downstrokes with his thumb. So obviously he could have picked up a pick and shredded all of everything, but he was so meticulous about the tone always being that that way, always this. And uh, he also pretty much always, not always, but used octaves, which is basically you know the the same note but the the higher register. So. As I'm learning, I'm always 